it felt like we were the nerdy version of church. So like in school and college, you know, you're not one of the cool kids. We knew we weren't one of the cool kids, but what you start to adapt to is this feeling that, but well, we're better, right? Most fundamentalists will tell you we're the purest version of that faith, right? And so it's an insecurity that leads to arrogance, which is kind of ironic. But what I find in my life is insecurity and arrogance are two sides of the same coin. And I just flip back and forth between the two. They compensate for each other. And so you just get wrapped more and more and more in it. As far as realizing that it was abuse, I didn't realize, I didn't, I didn't have that word for it, that language for it, till I was out for about 15 years. It wasn't a instantaneous thing. If you read the memoirs from the Duggar girls or some of these other high profile people who are coming out of similar background as me, depending on how many years they've been out of it, you can see how comfortable they are talking about that something was off. So like you knew some things were off, but you didn't have a, a label for it. You didn't have a language for it. You didn't, definitely didn't have a verse for it. Hello, and welcome to the Shifting Culture Podcast, in which we have conversations about the culture we create and the impact we can make. We long to see the body of Christ look like Jesus. I'm your host, Joshua Johnson. Go to shiftingculturepodcast.com to interact and donate. And don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app to be notified when new episodes come out each week. And go leave a rating and review. It's easy. It only takes a second, and it helps us find new listeners to the show. Just go to the show page on the app that you're using right now and hit five stars. Thank you so much. You know what else would help us out? Share this podcast with your friends, your family, your network. Tell them how much you enjoy it and let them know that they should be listening as well. If you're new here, welcome. If you want to dig deeper, find us on social media at Shifting Culture Podcast, where I post video clips and quotes and interact with all of you. Previous guests on the show have included Scott McKnight, Jason Van Ruler, and Jamie Winship. You can go back, listen to those episodes, and more. But today's guest is Ryan George. Ryan George is the author of Scared to Life and Word on the Street. Ryan's latest book is Hurt and Healed by the Church. He's the blogger behind Exploriance.org, and he co-founded and co-leads Dude Group, a spiritual adventure community in the Blue Ridge Mountains, where he lives with his wife, Crystal, and his daughter, Diani. Ryan grew up in an abusive, independent, fundamental Baptist church led by his father. In this conversation, Ryan discusses how he eventually left that church and the abuse of his father, and he started a journey of healing from the trauma of his upbringing. He talks about some of the unhealthy and abusive behaviors he experienced. He also talks about how he eventually found healthy church communities that helped him heal and come to know Jesus in a new way. We talk secure attachments, fear and faith, and adventure. So join us as we wade through destructive behavior and trauma and find our way out towards healthy, faith-filled communities centered on Jesus. Here's my conversation with Ryan George. Ryan, welcome to Shifting Culture. Really excited to have you. Thanks for joining me. Oh, I'm stoked. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, it's going to be good. But before we get into, you know, some fun adventure stuff and, and we we go into some reconstruction. We have to actually go into some of your story so we know where you're starting from. So can you tell me your story growing up with a yeah, independent fundamental Baptist preacher as a father? Yeah. What was that like? How was your, your growing up? And what was church for you? Oh, wow. Uh, that's a big question. I know it's a big question. So my parents were actually Lutheran and Catholic. And then when I was about four years old, uh, they joined this movement within the Baptist faith called the uh, Independent Fundamental Baptist. And then there's subsets beneath there. There's It, it just fractures out from there. Um, and so from about the age of four until I got married, that culture was all I knew. I went to an IFB college. I went to IFB camps. I was in an IFP church four services a week. My dad was bivocational. He got a letter to start a church on an island in Chesapeake Bay. So we spent 12 years there while he tried to get that off the ground. Uh, but I was homeschooled. And that's not a big surprise. Uh, very The term that I hear on a lot of podcasts, a lot of books I read is high control religion, a lot of superstition. If you do this, God will do that. Um, and on top of 
that, which I think is abusive theology, which is what was the original working title of this book, actually, that I'm pitching right now. But the uh, on top of that, there was also physical and verbal abuse in my home. Uh, later, as we would find out through podcasts and other things, that my dad was a serial sexual abuser as well. And so when I got married to a missionary kid and we started to figure out what do we actually believe as we, it was the first time in my life I ever had to shop for a church. I hate to use that term, but you know, to, to look around for a church. I live in a city that has over 200 churches. So, I mean, it's, it's literally a process of compare and contrast and, and start asking questions. What do I actually believe? I was mentored by some really thoughtful, introspective minds that asked me some really good questions at the right point in my life. And so I escaped that cultish behavior and have been on a journey ever since to overcome the shadow of my dad, overcome the shadow of the faith system that I had to actually find the real Jesus, <laughs> the one that was kept from me for so many years. So what's that like as you're in the middle of it? And this is all you know, you're swimming in this water where, you know, fish don't realize that they're in water. Definitely. A lot of times the culture that we're we're in, we we think is is normal. You think that this is how the world operates and works. What is it like being in the midst of that high controlling religion and having some spiritual abuse happen? And how do you start to open your eyes to it saying that this actually isn't Jesus? This isn't the, the thing that I'm seeking and this isn't right. How do you, how do you get to that spot? So those are two different questions. So what it, what it felt like, it felt like we were the nerdy version of church. So like in school and college, you know, you're not one of the cool kids. We knew we weren't one of the cool kids, but what you start to adapt to is this feeling that, but well, we're better, right? Most fundamentalists will tell you we're the purest version of that faith, right? And so it's an insecurity that leads to arrogance, which is kind of ironic, but what I find in my life is insecurity and arrogance are two sides of the same coin. And I just flip back and forth between the two. They compensate for each other. And so you just get wrapped more and more and more in it. As far as realizing that it was abuse, I didn't realize, I didn't, I didn't have that word for it, that language for it till I was out for about 15 years. It wasn't a instantaneous thing. If you read the memoirs from the Duggar girls or some of these other high profile people who were coming out of similar background as me, Depending on how many years they've been out of it, you can see how comfortable they are talking about that something was off. So like you knew some things were off, but you didn't have a, a label for it. You didn't have a language for it. You didn't, definitely didn't have a verse for it, you know? And so what changed in me was seeing the exact opposite, right? To be in faith environments, whether my church or parachurch or whatever, where you go, oh, that's what that's supposed to look like. Like that person actually looks like they love Jesus and like they're overwhelmed by him on a daily basis. That is in such contrast, like how they parent their kids, how their kids look at them, right? Or how they treat their wife or how they talk about culture, how they talk about people different than them. You know, I want to be like that person. And then as you talk to them and <laughs> this happened to me so many times as I'm in my church now, people look at me you're like, you're, you did what? Like you're, you guys did what? Like, at your college, guys and girls had separate sidewalks and elevators and staircases. Like, just some of the rules we had. Like, I wasn't allowed to talk to a girl before seven thirty in the morning. And like, uh, the, when I went to propose to my wife, my little brother had to come with. Right? Like, I'm at my grandma's house. I'm at my grandma's house, and my brother had to come with. So, like, there's just so many. You go, what in the world did we? And they had a Bible verse for everything, right? I'm just now trying to think about people that are in a, a similar situation that you were. And I think that some people don't realize that they're in that similar situation. Is it possible to start to detangle some of these things and realize what is going on without stepping back and away from it? I know your story is like you had to get away from it and you said the Duggar girls as well. And some of the Duggars are like, I have to step away. And then I realized, Hey, this is what was actually going on. Is there any way that we can start to detangle some of this abuse, certain control in the church while we're inside of it? Inside of the big C church. Yes. Inside of the church where this is happening. I don't think so because you'll start asking questions and questions aren't allowed. And I was I was physically 
uh, abused for asking questions, right? Like he just, when they didn't have an answer and when I called him on an answer, we like, I remember having these arguments with my dad and he would just, because he couldn't, it, it's not sustainable to say this is how Jesus would do it, right? Like, and so he had a, he had to quote unquote man up. He had to be aggressive on that. So I don't know now whether you end up in a church, uh, you know, that has services on Sunday, whether it's a faith community where it's people who believe in Jesus, but have been wounded and maybe they're in a therapist situation or a counseling group or a survivor. It can take different forms. Uh, and it has for me. Um, my counselor has a saying, I really appreciate this. She said, insecure attachment is healed through secure attachment. Relational wounds are healed through uh, re- healthy relationships. And she said, church wounds are healed through healthy church situations. And so I I fully give grace to people who are ready to come back to what you and I might describe as a church service or a church environment for a while. Um, but I have found whether it's hiking with people or traveling with people or going out to coffee or whatever, that the connection to people who have a healthy spirituality eventually will lead you back to places where more people like that are hanging out. That's one of the big things that we got trained in uh, to work with trauma victims, which we were with Syrian refugees, is that one of the first things to do is to create some some good memories. So the first mm-hmm. thing that they go back to is not the, the trauma, the wound of, of the past. They go back to those good memories. And so, you know, we did things like, you know, we had pinatas for Syrian refugees. So we had Mexican culture in the midst of Syrian culture. You know, we <laughs> had, you go. had different parties. We had sewing groups. We did a lot of, you know, Bible studies, sharing Jesus stories. There's all sorts of storytelling we we did. and But it was the activities that we did so that I could create new memories. What are some of those things as you talk about secure attachments and you're talking about a new things to heal the wounds of your past? What are some of the things that you started to engage in so that your the wounds of your past can become something that you can heal from and move on? Yeah, for a lot of it for me is outdoor adventures. So my number one spiritual pathway, depending on which framework you use, there's like seven or nine different spiritual pathways. My primary one is nature, which I actually didn't get a lot of as a kid. And so my one of my pastors is a trained wilderness guide. Another one is a incredible wilderness, whitewater kayaker, ice climber, you know, all those things. And so going outside and experiencing an environment where instead of a pulpit and rows and stuff is just projected at me and you don't ask questions where we're sitting around a campfire, you know, we're having these road trips, you know, those kind of things. The Bible study that I lead now, I think we have guys from four or five, maybe six different churches that comes every Wednesday night. We just sit around a fire. There's no teaching, you know, it's all egalitarian around the circle. It's those environments where people were Jesus to me and let me ask questions or ask me questions and let me go wrestle. I remember the first environment where a lot of this started to crack. I, and I just told this guy this Sunday, I said, this was 18 years ago this month. I said, you and your wife are leading our small group. And I've never been in a small group. That was the first time I've ever done that in a church. And I said, you guys were struggling with infertility and you said out loud, we're having a really hard time believing that God is good right now. And we were within the church walls, you know, and that utter honesty and authenticity just went, well, that's allowed here. Like you're allowed to say those things out loud. And so then some of the other things, like some of the things that my dad told me were secular, that weren't holy, that we shouldn't pursue, that I started to do looking with anticipation that Jesus would show up in them. I started to see him way more places than I was told that I could experience God, which makes sense, right? Because in it, uh, if if you are a man of God, which is what our cult called the pastor, uh, and you you only interact with Jesus at the house of God, he he's the one controlling the spigot of how much God you get, right? And so there's that's where the control comes in. So if you find out, oh, I don't have to go to that place and that guy to turn on the spigot to get it for myself, well then you can start to see Jesus all over the place. Um, and my last book, uh, what I wrote about, so I, I'm an adventure travel guy. I've been to all seven continents, both polar circles. I've, I've found Jesus in a whole bunch of places I never thought he would be, and he's been faithful in that way. As a side note, I think, uh, I don't know if you've read uh, Jesse Crookshank's book, Ordinary Discipleship, but she was a wilderness guide I for did. many years. Yeah, I read that last and year. And then and took there. Yeah. So 
I was just thinking, hey, she was a wilderness guy. It takes a lot of concepts from outdoors and, and talks about discipleship. It's really good. Well, the way that they're trained in Outward Bound and other of these uh, long-term wilderness guides is to go, okay, you just did something uncomfortable that you didn't know you could do or you didn't think you could do. What's something back home that's uncomfortable, whether it's in your faith, it's a relationship, whatever, that now you know that that's an arbitrary lie. And so there's so many parallels. I mean, Jesus did the same thing with parables, right? He's walking around and goes, here's a fig tree. Let's talk about that. Okay, here's a whitewater river. Let's talk, you know. And for me, because that's my primary spiritual pathway, I'm I'm wired for that. Yeah, wow. it's amazing. I love being outside in nature. I love creation. Growing up in Seattle, it's the you know, oh, same man. thing. I thought that... Uh, I thought the whole world looked like that until I, <laughs> I moved to the edge of a desert and in an ugly town. But, you know, what I love about your book, Hurt and Healed by by the Church, it actually takes the dysfunctions of church and then shows us a, a, a new way. Beast. So what are unsafe churches and then what are healthy churches look like? And you go like every chapter, you're you're into a new a new health of, of church. And so contrasting unhe- unsafe unhealthy to to healthy as you were starting to to write some of those things was there anything that you started to realize that you were growing up in or even the church experiences that you have now that were unhealthy and unsafe that you didn't actually realize until you started writing and digging deeper into what this is that's fascinating i haven't thought about that I'm sure there, I'm sure some of the details for sure, how pervasive something is. Um, When I started writing about the silencing of women, I think that's the longest chapter in the book. And I didn't start out for that to be true. But my wife is a gifted discipler. Um, One of our pastors stepped off of professional uh, pastoring to go into the marketplace. And when he, uh, he's still at our church, he serves with me on Sundays. But when he left, he said, your wife is the best discipler that we have in this, in this community. And it's true. I mean, I, there's constant women in our house being counseled. I, I see my wife's location tracker. She's at a different person's house all day long. She's just, like, and I went, Oh, not letting my wife do that, which my dad wouldn't have allowed. Right. And the high control religion, but women, women don't minister, right? How, how much that's connected to abuse, how much guys are men in particular are, insecure that women might do ministry better. That was probably one of the ones that was a big aha moment for me. Yeah. There's, there's several of those where I, I, I knew all of them because obviously I outlined it before I started writing, but as I got into it, I went, Oh, this is way more pervasive than what I thought. The ones that was surprising. And I knew it physically. I've spent so much time in my counselor's office talking, trying to feel things because for so many years I wouldn't listen to my body because my body told me to run. Right. Um, and I wrote a I wrote a chapter on the war motif, and another chapter on anger and how everything about the churches I grew up was based in anger. Like there was everything, and I started quoting a whole bunch of pastors and I, I, names out of the books. One of them because the guy threatened to sue me if I did, but I never realized how much my faith was built on anger and and just being torqued off all the time. So what does that do? If you we get into this place of anger, and I think even in uh, this political day and age in America that we live in, we're we're angry uh, to try and get somebody to to our side. And you know, Jesus Jesus did something a little bit different as he interacted with people. He he was angry at times. You know, he flipped some tables at the the temple because they were misusing the temple selling selling things for profit when this is a, a place of of worship so how do you how do we wrestle with that and deal with that as we're starting to talk to people and to get away from our our angry positions that we start to try and woo people through anger is there a new way what's a better way a way that we should enter into so two answers on that first is anger doesn't woo anybody but other angry people, right? Like this show that's like, everybody's talking about this love is blind show. Nobody comes in there and just goes on tirades to try to attract somebody. Like when you're on Tinder and you get, you finally get the date or whatever app Bumble or whatever. I never use an app. I'm that old, but <laughs> you get on the date and you, you don't show up and just start putting somebody on blast. That doesn't, 
it's not attractive. And so I don't, I don't think that I realized definitely the, the movement I came out of realized how unattractive it was. But the other part, I don't think they realized part two is that that wasn't Jesus's mode of operandi. That was his exception. If anything, that the fact that it only happened once and in, in, the recording of his ministry, he didn't deputize. He didn't go, hey, guys, you guys build some whips too. Why don't you flip some tables? He, There was no, hey, go do likewise. There are other things that Jesus said, go and do likewise or do as I've you've seen me do or whatever. He didn't turn around his disciples like, this is it. This is how we do this. This That was the exception to the rule. And it was incredibly meek because that dude could have just said gone and there would be nothing. There would be no molecules in front of him. And so... I actually see that scene as that a lot of the angry people of my youth use as justification for their anger as actually demonstrating the exact opposite. It's like that's Jesus's meekness on display. That's really good to to think through that. So what does it look like to enter in meekly into conversation and with people? How do we do that? Well, asking, asking soft questions. There's a question that we ask all the time in the faith environments that I'm in is like, hey, help me understand that. What's going on inside of you? I'll ask a guy, what have you been praying about this week? Because that usually shows where his anxiety is, right? And if he says, I don't, I couldn't pray this week, but okay. So what's behind that? You know, I think seeking to understand, coming in and going. Uh, so I, I went on a trip last year to, or two years ago to the Faroe Islands out in the North Atlantic. And a guy I was with is far from Jesus. I grew up around ministries, seen the dark underbelly of it, said, I'm not going to have any part of it. And he said that on the trip. I was like, okay, so what's bringing you life? You know, and eventually you can get into some really cool conversations, right? I keep coming back to the word winsome, that Jesus is, there were people, everybody from every perspective, Jew and Gentile, male and female, rich and poor, religious and not, everybody was attracted to Jesus. Why was that? Because no matter how you came to him, he was ready for you and welcoming. It, before he told the rich young ruler to go sell everything, it, the Bible tells us, and, and Jesus must have told his disciples this because this is not something he said out loud. He said Jesus had compassion on him. Right? Like there's this whole, before he told the woman who was caught underneath her adultery, you know, go sin no more. Before, he said, hey, I don't condemn you. There's this approachability to it to go, hey, you can say whatever you need to say in front of me and I'm not going to. I'm not going to judge you for it. Now, I've had guys confess to molesting their daughter. I did, you know, I've had guys confess to some things in their marriage. There are action steps on that, but but there, even there are softer ways to do that too, you know. <laughs> you said there's softer ways to do that. Okay. I That's that's curious for me. So if I, I'm in a situation where somebody is revealing, you know, a, a sin to me that is not just... A, we have to deal with this together. You repent to the Lord, but it's something we actually have to report and we have to to give to the authorities because this is we just have to get you away it's from vile. Mm-hmm. it's vile that situation. How do you do that in a softer way that shows compassion to the person that's in front of you when it is a vile situation? Yeah, I remember after the guy confessed at a table. I was in a restaurant. The guy confessed it to me. I've been pouring into this guy. Now we're not friends on Facebook anymore. Like I'm not. We reported it. He went and served his time. Uh, there's a registry that he is going to be on for however long our state does that. But I prayed over him. I put my hand on his shoulder and I prayed over him because he knows what's coming next, right? You go, hey. It took courage. You call out what was true. It took courage to tell us that. Andy Stanley has this saying that I really like. I quote it all the time. Is some things are not problems to be managed, they're ten- or problems to be solved, they're tensions to be managed. And there's a tension there going, I forgive you. In my family, I forgive my dad. And I pray probably three times a month, dear God, help me continue to forgive my dad when I feel these emotions come up. But at the same time, would you soften his heart and heal him? You know. And while that both of those are true, I also don't, I'm not physically around my dad. I do not answer his text. He's not allowed around my daughter, my wife. You know, so it's it's not, there's no clear cut answers to these. You know, right now in Kansas City, you know, there's, uh, you know, IHOP Kansas City dealing with a lot of abuse, yeah, sexual abuse of minors like, of, you know, Mike Bickle. So there's, 
a lot of reeling from like, oh my gosh, like what have I been in? And we have had some people come from IHOP to our church and come in and, and joining. And right now they're in, they're in a lot of pain. There's mm-hmm. a lot of, you know, it's, it's really hard for them to, to trust a, another congregation to trust the church to say, is this going to be okay? Like, I love Jesus. I want to be around people who love Jesus, but I don't know if I can trust the church right now. How, so for people like that, that are coming out of this, these, yeah, revelations that they didn't quite see, and now everything is reeling, what are some steps to take in that healing process moving forward for these groups of people. Yeah. I think one of the first things to do is to acknowledge with them. Yes, this is disorienting, you know, to go this conflict. Do you feel that is totally reasonable? You don't have to come back to a church building out of guilt. I would definitely recommend there go visit a therapist, particularly a Christian therapist trained in either high control religion or abuse, uh, trauma recovery, whatever, which is what I see or who I see. I had this conversation two weeks ago, a friend of mine, she had a bad experience at our church, right? It wasn't abuse like how we would define it, but it was a really uncomfortable situation that now every time she walks in the building, it's, it's triggering to her. And it, it's like, you need to know, like, we love you. We love our church. We love you, but we're okay that you don't feel safe here, but please keep looking for a safe place. I, did, I think there's so many deconstructions, podcasts and books. I've, I've read a whole bunch of them in preparation for this press tour and for writing my own book is to go. I think what a lot of people do is they just, they keep running and they never get it fixed. They never go, they never ask their soul the level of questions like, what did I, what did I love about being in a faith community? What do I miss about being in a faith community? Where can I get that in smaller doses in safe ways and then work myself back in? The point isn't for us all to go to a Sunday service. The point of us all is to be connected to Jesus with other people who are connected to Jesus. Some people might say, I can't do a, a Sunday morning service. That's the thing that feels very unsafe for me and triggering. How could people start to find their Jesus community and a community that is safe to, to move forward if it isn't a Sunday morning service, what is the what are communities out in the wild look like that are like surrounded saying Jesus is our, our center and we're going to move forward together as community that's healthy? That's an interesting question because I didn't, this, is, this sounds really weird. I didn't go looking for it. It found me. There, there was one environment in our church that I absolutely loved uh, and it got shut down because it was dwindling numbers, dwindling numbers. And, but the model of it, I absolutely loved. And so I just went out and started my own and started inviting guys from in my life to say, hey, you have Jesus and you have a version of Jesus that I like. We started with three guys and now there's almost 40 guys in the group text, right? There was a guy going through a hard season and I just said, hey, I'll tell you what, I don't have curriculum. I don't know. I'm not a trying. I wasn't even in therapy at this time. I didn't know anything. He was just going through a hard time. I was like, let's meet every Wednesday night. We'll read a chapter of a book from Bob Goff. We'll pray over each other. You know, whatever it is to help you come for yard, get you through the week till Sunday. And so I just started looking for people one at a time. And now what's funny is wives will come to me and they'll say, hey, I've heard about this thing that you guys have going down at the park on Wednesday nights. Would you be cool with my husband? Or could you reach out to my husband or whatever? So I, I don't know exactly if there's a prescriptive way to do it because we've done it on the down low. My wife's the ministry that she started that now is part of our church. They were not, they were affiliated with our church when they started, but they were a home, they created their home thing. So I don't know that I would hope no matter what you came out of that Jesus would give you one person that looks real in your life, whether that's somebody you meet online or follow on Instagram or yeah, I don't that's a really tough question. I, I feel very blessed because mine fell into my life at the exact moment I needed them. And some of them like a year or two before I really needed them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's one of the things that we're, we're wrestling with a little bit within our church is that there's some people have a big desire for that. I think men especially have a desire for, for deeper connection. 
with other men, but don't actually know how to go about like reaching out. They feel vulnerable, insecure of like, hey, opening up to the place of saying, I need somebody now. Can you meet with me? Can you be with me? And I'm I'm really appreciative of the people that reach out to me and say, hey, can we meet and we talk? Because it's easier to receive something like that. It's hard for somebody to to make that first move. How what as you're hanging out, you're doing these this thing with with all these these men. How do men start to reach across and saying, I need connection. I need help in this place. Let's let's meet. What are some ways that men can can do that? Well, let me back up and say one other thing. I, I think we can claim the promise of Jesus. He said, if you seek me, you will find me. If you seek me, your own whole heart. And I think Jesus, the way he designed the church to be, he wants people to be in spiritual community with him and with others. So I think if, if, if you don't have that one person to be praying for, God will bring that person to you. As far as uh, how to make men comfortable in those environments, one of my mentors gave me a, a an imperative several years ago. He said, give men the gift of going second. And so whenever I'm in an environment, particularly where there's new guys, um, a lot of guys will come, they'll sit around the fire for a week and just, you can see them, they're looking around. How does this how does this group work? What's the dynamics here? And so what I try to do is whatever level of authenticity I want those guys to eventually get to, I have to model. So I have to say, I'm struggling in my marriage this week with X, or um, I've, I've really been wrestling with this truth that Jesus did, or for me, so I never wanted to be a dad. You can read about in the book, all the abuse that I had as a kid. I just didn't want to be a dad. I didn't trust myself. And God... I sit, bless me against my will. I was on a helicopter expedition up in British Columbia. I get back to civilization. There's a text saying, oh, by the way, a young lady sought refuge in your home. Long story short, she's now my daughter. So I went from actively trying not to be a dad to all of a sudden I am a dad, you know, to then pursuing adoption. And so just to be real, my guys be like, hey, guys, you guys know. I had all three versions of a vasectomy make sure this wouldn't happen. Like, and here I am, and I have a 15-year-old African-American daughter now. Like, I'm scared. Or I don't know what to do. I've never washed a bra from somebody other than my wife. Like, what do you do with this, right? I don't know if I got that specific. But just to be like, I I didn't save for this. I don't have money to buy her a car. I don't have money to put her through college. Like that. So the level of authenticity that the person who starts the conversation sets the tone for the circle and I've seen that in multiple faith environments, not just mine. It's interesting because therapy doesn't work that way, right? Like your therapist doesn't tell their, they can't tell you stuff about their life. But in outside of therapy, that has been true of almost every environment where I left feeling that my heart was seen and my soul was felt by another man, another you know, parishioner was somebody went first. And I've, I've been with grown men crying in an airport in South America, confessing something they never, you know, I've been going through this and I never told anybody, you know, about their job, their marriage, their kids, their parents, whatever it is. So if we give people the gift of going second, and again, if we're looking for it, people are going to be attracted to the people who are authentic like that. You know, for what I, I see in you is I, I see somebody who is a learner, somebody that, that loves adventure and wants to connect deeply with others. That's pretty difficult when what was modeled for most <laughs> of your life was the quite the opposite it is don't be vulnerable be certain be strong yell and say this is this is the right way and don't have any insecurities and if you do hide them right how do you how do you move into a new space and learn a totally opposite completely different way of life what is that transition like to relearn the way you interact in the world I learned basically what you're saying is the first part of my life, I was controlled by sticks, not carrots. Right. And what I've learned is, is to use my body's biological dopamine reward system. So when I do something scary, like base jump or bungee jump or skydive, or whatever, I I go out on the wings of airplanes while they're doing aerobatic maneuvers. It's one of my fun things to do. The first, the, how many people say that? There's there's (laughs) only like 1300 people in the world who've gone through the class. (laughs) It's amazing. It's incredible. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I'm scared like crazy. People think that I 
don't that I do those things because I'm not scared. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm actually scared of heights. Like I freak out. I do them though, because I am scared because the way our body works with dopamine and all the other adrenaline, all the other chemicals we get is the reward is roughly proportional to how scared we are. Right. And so it's been the same in my faith life, right? When I've asked a question that I thought was scary and it was met with grace and met with kindness and met with, all right, let's talk about that. Yeah. So the reward for that becomes habit for me, right? So when I, when I have to have a heart, I hate, I am non-confrontational to an end because of the way I grew up, right? And I've seen my wife model, like sometimes you have to address things with people and I'm so scared. And it's amazing how many times you go again with softly and all the ways you do it appropriately. But you get there and then you go and at the end of it, you're closer than when you started. You go, oh, so what happens is there's this reward system. When you say, when you say, I don't know, right? That's a very scary thing to say in a faith community. Or when you say, I'm scared or whatever it is. Now, when that's met, now that's not always met with what you need, right? That's we're humans. But Jesus has been so faithful to me that so many times when I'm scared, uh, relationally, spiritually, whatever, he's met me there. And then part of it too was realizing, oh, so I have to have a lot of faith in my harness for a lot of things that I do. I have to have a lot of faith in the equipment and my pilot, whatever it is. And Jesus said the just shall live by faith. That's all throughout the New Testament. Paul said, other people said it. But you can't have faith unless there's a little doubt or a little fear or both. So I'm not scared on the wing of an airplane unless I don't trust my pilot. I don't trust my equipment, right? If So the faith, the word faith for me growing up meant you're totally sure of things. Now, I am confident in my pilot. He's a former aerobatic, or he's still an aerobatic pilot and a former like Air Force fighter or whatever. But it wasn't until I grew comfortable with him that I grew less fearful out on the wing, if that makes sense. And so this idea for faith for me is such a real object lesson because so many times I have to trust. I remember I was up in your old neck of the woods outside of Seattle. I went to Dirt Fish Race School. And it's where you learn how to ride rally, drive rally cars, kind of like slide around curves and stuff. And my instructor kept saying, you're hitting the brake too early. He's like, I told you not to hit it until I say brake. He's like, you don't trust that I know when to break. Because we were driving at a concrete barrier. He's like, it's not yet. And he's like, you lost all your momentum to finish this whole big cool thing because you needed to break before I said break. You have to trust me more than your eyes. And once I learned that, I didn't hit break until he said, man, I started to do some stuff with a car I've never done in my life. Right? And it's the same thing. So I have all these object lessons to go, oh, God, that's what you mean. And, and then that transferred not just spiritually, but relationally to go, when I say the hard thing to a friend, when I confront this, or it may be an awkward encouragement. That's a weird thing. But in guys' worlds, there's weird things to encourage other guys. When you say that awkward thing, that's maybe not the most alpha male NFL, you know, scratch your chest type of thing. And then it's re- received with tears or with someone saying, hey, would you be, would you officiate my wedding? Or, you know, would you do whatever counseling or whatever. Oh, and so the rewards I've learned my faith system now is built on my reward system. That's interesting. What's the scariest thing you've ever done? How'd you get courage to do it? Uh, become a dad. <laughs> and I didn't, <laughs> I came home and it was, it was there, but even in that, so like I, I wrote, this is in the last chapter of the book, as I said, uh, so many things opened up for me and my family and of how I see Jesus. I, I always, like to talk about God through Jesus, not as God the Father, because fatherhood is scary for me. And I said, but God wanted me to pursue adoption of our daughter to show me how he pursues our heart. I get more scared doing relational stuff than I do jumping off of cliffs or mountains or whatever. Yeah, relational things are, are scary. And walking into those things, it's really difficult to to open yourself up, especially when you've been in, in a situation uh, and a life that you have been in, it's hard to to open up. And but once you continue to see grace after grace, you see you're met with with loving kindness, um, and that you could actually then start to move into secure attachment uh, to others. Then you're able to safely open up with those people. And I think that's really important to be able to do that. You have your reward system. You have adventure. What? does it mean for us to have the the adventure of faith 
how do we move into our faith as adventure and not just a, a box that we have to check to say, I've <laughs> done my my spiritual thing. What does it look like to have adventure faith? People have asked me, like, so do you think everybody should go out on the wings of an airplane? I, I don't have any problem with it. I don't think it's fit for everybody. And not my wife, right? Like, But what I've said to people who ask me that is this, but all of us have something in the back of our head that we're scared of. And we need to move towards that. One of my buddies gave his life to Christ not long after this really weird encounter. He was at our local grocery store and he was short to pay cash for batteries. And he didn't want to use his company credit card because then he got to report into the receipts, whatever else. And some stranger walked all, he, to this day, we still don't know who this guy is. He's never met, walked all the way from the front of the grocery store, put the amount of change on the belt that he needed and walked away. But before he left, he said, Jesus told me to give you that and just walked away. I was like, that dude at the door, again, we don't know his name. I don't even remember his age and from the story. Got an assignment from Jesus <laughs> to go put a dollar forty seven or whatever it was on the belt and walk away and say, Jesus loves you. That was probably the weirdest, scariest thing. And and that dude probably also doesn't know that my buddy John gave his life to Jesus. Right. I've been so scared. I was in Portland writing my last book and and I I was had this prop, put this map exact number of large tip on their uh, on your tab and write Jesus loves you on the on the receipt. And I struggled for like three minutes with that. <laughs> so they're like, come on, I can't. This is Portland. Like I've heard about Portland. This isn't the right kind of weird, you know? But in those moments, we all have that. Uh, a lot of times it's relational. It's to, hey, send a card to that person. And, you know, in our culture, it's not normal for men to send each other cards, to call something out and somebody say, hey, I saw this in you and I just think it should be affirmed. I do it all the time, but it was, it still gets weird. It never gets easy. And so I think we all have something and it's different for each of us, right? Like there are people who pine to be parents. I mean, they, the, all this discussion right now about in vitro fertilization, how much tens of thousands of dollars and all the medical procedures to try. And for them being a parent wasn't courageous at all. Like that's the passion of their heart. For me, that was scarier than doing aerobatics on an airplane out on the wing. Right. And so I think we, we all have something. And if we don't have one on a regular basis, I, I tell this to people all the time. If God hasn't given me an uncomfortable assignment in a while, I check in with Jesus and be like, hey, are we good? <laughs> right? Because if the just shall live by faith, I have to keep being put in positions where I need faith to go, oh, I got to trust him for this. This is so awkward. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's tough to to go out. I think one of the things there is the nudging of the Holy Spirit. You know, going into a probably you know from a space. I think growing up, you probably didn't want to to be able to say, "Hey, I hear from the Holy Spirit." <laughs> and be able to do do that. You know, the man of God in the in the house of God gets to to do those things and tells you what to think, right? So, so how do you start to hear the the nudging and the voice of the Holy Spirit in your everyday life? What does that look like for you? So uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Erwin McManus, the pastor out in Los Angeles, but he has a saying that when you say yes to God, his voice becomes louder and clearer, louder and clearer. And when you say no, it becomes fainter and fainter and fainter. And so I just got afraid that I would, I have to say yes to whatever he puts in front of me so that I don't lose connection to his voice. So the first one, one of the first yeses for me was to go to a church that didn't look like the one I grew up in. I mean, I was... I didn't tell my parents. I didn't tell my, like nobody. I didn't even tell my pastor at the time. I was living out in Indiana and we sneaked to this other church on the weekends. That was my first yes. Right. And then you get other yeses to go, oh, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to put myself out there and try a small group thing that I hear about. I'm going to try. And eventually it's not that they all build and get bigger and bigger. It's just that, I don't know, for me, the more I say yes, the more assignments I get. If somebody is afraid that they're going to to fail if they say yes and they, they move forward so they're afraid of that of that yes is there anything that you could you could share to help them have courage to move into something even though it may not even work out well i would definitely tell them it may not work out <laughs> it doesn't always in my life i also affirm in people this sounds really weird but i affirm i was like it's good that you're scared I remember the first time I told that to somebody, oh, what was it? It was one of the adrenaline things I did. And, oh, no, it was me. I remember the first time I bungee jumped. 
I won't swear on your podcast, but I swore in front of this guy. He goes, how, how are you doing right now? I was about to jump. It was 439 feet. Well, I'm looking down. I'm scared. Bleak. And we're in New Zealand. He goes, that's good, mate. The more scared you are, the better the ride is down. And so what I tell people is, you're right to be scared. That is a hard conversation to have with your wife. That is an awkward moment with your son. Let's talk about that. What are your prayers like? What would you ask Jesus for? I, I like to turn it into a teaching moment, right? To go, all right, so how do we pray about this? What is the Bible? Are there any verses? Is there any things in Jesus' example or in his stated words in the red letters that would speak to this right now? What did, what did Jesus do when it got awkward? <laughs> like, and so, yeah, I, I tend to affirm the fear. And it's easy for me because in my community around here, I'm known as adventure guy, right? Like, the, oh, well, that's just fine. But you can have powerful moments when you go, yeah, that's a natural thing to feel right now. And also, Jesus designed our systems to feel this. <laughs> like we, He's not, one of the phrases I use all the time, Jesus is not pacing the floor of heaven, hoping that you pick the right answer. Like he's just, he's going to be with you no matter what. And so you don't have to worry that you're going to lose Jesus' love, that you're going to lose your faith community. Like, I mean, if you're committing a crime, it's one thing. But I mean, most of the decisions that people have in front of them, you go, just be Jesus in that situation. Figure out what that is. Yeah, that's good. The first time I went budgie jumping was in New Zealand as well. And uh, yeah, it was so scary. Like it was the day after I got married and then I jumped off the the bridge, you know. That's fantastic. (laughs) And uh, then, you know, my wife was there was in Queenstown. So my wife yeah. then went paragliding. She wouldn't go bungee jumping, but she's like, I'll, I'll jump off a mountain. I'll do that. So we both That's a had good spot got for to paragliding. Jump. It's a beautiful spot, man. It's one of the most beautiful places. I've right at the bottom been. of the gondola. Yeah. Yeah. So gorgeous. So amazing. Oh, man, I want to go back. Now, yeah, you me made too. me pine for New Zealand. It's time to go back to New Zealand. Ryan, what's a, what's a hope that you have for your readers reading uh, this incredible yeah. book? That they would feel seen. It's been interesting. So I've given advanced reader copies to, I don't know, 100 different people. And the number one feedback I get from people is, you wrote that book for me. Like, I, you wrote my story. I was like, well, that's because there's tens of thousands of people in our country with this story. Maybe maybe their dad isn't in the news for sexually abusing a series of women. That That's kind of niche. But to be in a high control religion or to to transition from a superstitious faith to one that gives you life. So I hope people find courage to tell their story, to go, yeah, I'm I'm ready to tell the world. This was me too. That would be huge. It it's not a book to convince people to go to church. It tells people how I found a safe church, you know? But yeah, I just hope people feel safe to tell their stories and that it leads them to an environment where they can tell because i think it's a chain reaction right that when you tell your story then it gives somebody else the courage to tell theirs and it, we keep this going until hopefully we can root more and more of the stuff out of the church yeah that's that's my prayer over and over i, w- I want to see the church look like jesus and uh i mean that's that's why we're here we're the and we're supposed to be the embodiment of jesus to the world like this is we're supposed to look exactly like jesus he gave us his gifts so that we could look like him so, and we could grow up into him who's the head and that he is full of love and grace and compassion. I, we need to be more compassionate to listen to each other's stories and to, to be safe people, to be able to, to receive those stories and not deflect. We're really good at deflecting stories. Mm-hmm. We're good at deflecting things or even saying, I can't enter into your story because I feel pain right now. And so mm-hmm. that's the only thing that I can focus on. I can't focus on somebody else's story. But I know in my life when I have pain, sorrow that I'm going through, it actually also helps me listening to other people's stories. It's not just for the person telling the story, but that goes a long way. Storytelling it should, is- It shouldn't surprise us. That's how Jesus designed the church to work. Uh, amen. <laughs> amen. James wrote, uh, confess your sins one to another so that you may be healed. Yeah. Now, it's not always sins that we're confessing, but that principle works for me. The The more I tell my story, the more healing I find from telling my story. Yeah. And why why should we be surprised that that's how it works when that's how the Bible says it should? Yeah. Jesus said, I came to give you life, life more abundant. I came to set you free. We are, 
so many people in his culture and currently in ours think of that as like a political freedom or like a specific mandate. I was like, no, 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 no. Uh, one of my favorite verses in the Old Testament is where God said, hey, I came to remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. In other words, I want you to feel more, not less. Like I'm the inventor of emotions. I'm the inventor of physicality. I want to inhabit that space with you so that you can feel more. He's like, I, I want to turn your RGB levels up. <laughs> you know, like I want your world to be full color and you experience all. That's why I gave you so many senses because I want you to experience me as much as you can. And we could have a whole other conversation about <laughs> yeah. uh, about emotions and feeling. Yeah. Especially. Yeah. Okay. But let's uh, go back to advice that you would give to your 21 year old self. And I think this is, this would be helpful for anybody in your situation when you were 21. So what, what advice would you give to yourself now? So I've been listening to your podcast to prepare for this interview. Yeah. I heard which I kind of was like, oh no. <laughs> Cause I have a like back to the future view. Like if I went back to 21 year old me, I think I would mess everything up. You know, if I, I, I could, I could be a lot wealthier now. <laughs> But as far as, and as far as so I've been thinking, like, I'd have to have an answer for Joshua. I have to have an answer. And I, I think what I would tell 21 year old me is instead of chasing affirmation, chase influence. So whether you will ever be noticed, recognized, no matter how many likes you get, no matter, you know, I was bullied in school. I wasn't one of the cool kids. I tried so hard. One of the, re the reason I got into action sports was to try to prove to the world that I was worth their attention. And I would turn on that GoPro and I'd suddenly have courage to do the things that I never had courage to do in my life just hoping for a little bit of dopamine on Facebook. And I would tell a 21 year old me, Hey man, you, you may not ever get enough of that. If you believe Solomon at all. And I do having traveled all over the world, you can take that train all the way out and it still won't be enough. But what it feels like when you see your influence coming alive and the people you disciple and the people that you mentor that there's an abundance of that. And that's plentiful. That's really good. And that goes from the macro to the micro, right? That your the influences in the micro areas, the places where it's in relationships one to another on on a place where you could actually have conversations with people, right? So I think that's really important. So, I mean, that's what discipleship looks like mm -hmm. is we're discipling others in community, in relationship. Uh, it has to be, a shared life has to be part of it. You know, I could... You know, I could have all these conversations I want. That's great. But I have to have a shared life with others to grow in loving relationship with Jesus as well. So that's good. I love that. That's a great, great answer. Good. I passed. Great answer. <laughs> good job. Good job. Anything you've been reading, watching lately you could recommend? Absolutely. So I try, I haven't been able to read uh, for the last three months because of preparing for relaunching my book and whatever else, for whatever reason, I can't, I've listened to my book just that I'm ready to quote it and whatever. Uh, but the last book I read was the best book I read in 2024 by, he goes, Sean Dietrich, he goes by Sean of the South. And I think it's called Will the Circle Be Unbroken? There's a heron on the front cover. And he lost his dad to suicide when he was like 12, I think. And it's about how he put his life back together after losing his dad. Um, and it's beautiful. It is for a man who never got a high school diploma, it is the best writing I've ever read. Um, I read both of his books, but the, the, his last two books. But yeah, it just, I was in the canyon lands of Texas uh, New Year's and right after finishing uh, listening to that book and he had recorded it in the same studio that I recorded mine. That's how I found out about it. And we're going down this canyon, 1600 foot rock walls on either side, going down the Rio Grande, Mexico on the right. Texas on the left and a heron lands in front of me and follows me the entire trip out. It's just staying just off the end of my canoe. And I lost it. I just wept. And it was as if Jesus was saying, I, I sent you that book about how to deal with grieving your father right before this time when you'd have to go and talk to a whole bunch of people about what it is to lose so much that fatherhood carries, what church meant to you, whatever else. And it was a very tender moment with my heavenly father. And so maybe I have more connection to that book than most of the people who would hear this or see this. But, but man, it was, it was absolutely powerful. Yeah. I have a friend uh, who lost her sister and really close and a, a heron came uh, and, and that as she was just, you know, on her porch watching and that gave her, you know, so much hope that she was still there with her. It was for some reason, you know, herons are a sign 
that God's with us, which is int- interesting. Yeah, I've, I've yeah, heard that more than, on, than when once. When I was growing up in Chesapeake Bay, I worked at a golf course that was built out into the water, and I, I mowed the greens. You know, I was un, you know unskilled labor, and in the morning, you know, my house was tumultuous, right? So work was actually a safe place for me, and just sit there in the morning and watch these herons. Uh, they can stand utterly still for hours. And I can't, I still struggle to be still for more than three minutes because my thoughts get too much. And you go, man, I would love to just sit in that water for 45 minutes waiting for one fish. Like it's just so fascinating. I still go back to my memories of, of setting pins in the morning, early morning when before everybody, everybody gets up, you know, it's, it is such a peaceful place to be out there on the, you were the advanced, course. man. They never let me set pins. Points to you, man. <laughs> I I was not good enough to do that. Uh, thank you, thank you. I was advanced. Uh, yeah, maybe it's you know my my best friend's family on the golf course. Oh, they, there you go. You had an in. Oh, I had an in. <laughs> I did. I had an in. So, Ryan, how could people uh, get your book and connect with you? Where would you like to point people to? Yeah, so two places. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram. I'm making all my announcements there. It's I'm at Ryplane. It's R Y P L A N E. And then you can order all the various versions of my book at booksbyryan.com because uh, right now you can pre-order and then as more and more editions are available, audiobook, ebook, whatever, they will all be posted right there at booksbyryan.com. Well, Ryan, this is a fantastic book to take people into your story of, of abuse, but then moving into a place of reconstruction and being healed by the church and saying mm-hmm. that the church can be a safe place. We can find our community. We can find the people that would, would show us a, a, a better way, a new way, a way that looks like Jesus. And so I, I do pray that many people are seeing this, if they're in this situation, that they could find their way into safe communities that will love them the way that Jesus loved the sinner, the one, the abused, the outcast, the, the lonely. He loved us all and he sees us all and we as community can do that for other people so i just pray that they are able to find that safe space and the place where they're going to be be healed in a way that brings them to a loving relationship with with jesus and man because humans suck sometimes but <laughs> jesus we get in the way of it for sure amazing we do get in the way of it so Ryan, thank you for this book and thank you for this conversation. It was really fun to talk to you. So thank you so much. Oh, thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the show today. If you're really enjoying the show, please don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app. You could do it right now. Just hit that little plus. Um, And then I would love it if you would leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. So you could go right now to the show and leave a star rating uh, and review and let us know how you are enjoying the show. And find us on Facebook and Instagram. So if you want to connect, interact, uh, I post a lot of quotes and different things that you could actually interact with the episodes and let me know how you are enjoying the show. If you feel inclined to donate, uh, there is a support the show link in the show notes, um, and it would send you directly to a page where you could donate so that new episodes can be produced for your enjoyment. So thank you so much for listening, uh, and I hope you have an incredible week.